Okay, uh, let's start uh, working through some of these problems uh, related to gene expression data. What I'd like to do is uh, start from the original data, start from the wild type data that we've been talking about. And you see that I've highlighted one piece of data just so that we can follow it all the way through um, all of the different pieces of the solution that we have for creating a network for this data. Um, basically, I start with the spreadsheet that we have here, the wild type data. I save this spreadsheet as a, a comma separated value file. It's just a more convenient file to work with uh, from Java. I write some Java programs that basically take this data and convert it into um, some convenient file formats that Cytoscape can use. So uh, the first file format that I'll talk about is clusterednodes.sif. Okay, it's a SIF file. It um, basically records interactions, and if your nodes don't interact with anything, it's basically just a long list of nodes. Okay, and you can see the first one on the list is the same gene that's being highlighted in the spreadsheet. Okay, so the SIF file basically just records all of the nodes that we care about, and each node in this case represents a gene. Okay, so far so good. The second file that the Java programs produce is called clusterednodes.pvals. This one, as you can see, is a little more complicated, uh, but it basically corresponds more or less exactly to the spreadsheet. It starts with a gene name, okay, and you can see the one where the cursor is sort of over now is the same one that's highlighted in red in the spreadsheet. And it breaks down all of the expression data into um, two parts. So we have uh, six sort of time sequences that we're looking at. And you can see that those time sequences, they go from zero to five in my list here, they're repeated twice, okay? And they're repeated twice for the following reason. The first six values correspond to the uh, M data that we've been talking about. So the first six items here, okay, would be represented as the first six items here. And then again, the A values will follow. So basically this line reads more or less exactly like the spreadsheet, except that we've removed the gene prediction column, we've removed the known genes column, the Q value column, and the cluster column. Okay, so when we remove all of those columns, all we have is just the genes, the layout of the gene expression data, and this is the file format. This pvals file format is the one that's the most convenient for Cytoscape to read in this data. Okay, so that's the second file. The third file is really simple. We want to add an additional uh, attribute to each node that represents the cluster that it's in. So the file format starts with the cluster, and then for each node that we're talking about, each gene, we assign it to a particular cluster. So the A02 gene is in cluster 9, and we can see that that matches the uh, value in the spreadsheet. So there's really no magic here. Um, I simply read in the comma separated values and rewrite the values as needed by Cytoscape in those three forms. The SIF format for the nodes and the links if we had them. Uh, the pvals for the specific gene expression data and the gene that it maps to. And finally, any additional data that we might like, in this case, the cluster data. So once we have those three files, we can sort of jump over to Cytoscape and just go through the quick process of importing them, okay? It makes it really easy to do. You just go to File, Import. We're gonna start with the network. And we just wanna take clusterednodes.sif open it up, and import. Now, when it starts, it'll give you this nice feedback message and tell you what it imported. Okay, no no problem. Um, when it starts, it's going to be really, really boring. Okay, it's just a whole bunch of nodes with no links and no real data associated with them. Don't worry, we're gonna change that as quickly as we can. Um, let's start by bringing in that gene expression data. So we're gonna say file import, 
we're going to select attribute expression matrix and as you might expect we'll be picking the clustered nodes.pvals file it'll ask you what you want what property you want to assign these uh, values to the ID is both the default and the appropriate one that we want. Okay, it's perfectly fine. We have basically populated our nodes with that ID. Okay, and the and in our data set, that ID is going to be the gene that we're modeling. So the ID is the appropriate association for that. Just click import. It will tell you the number of genes, it will tell you the number of conditions, six and it will tell you if we have significance values. Okay, and the significance values basically map to what we've been calling our A data. Um, we'll have to confirm that that's actually what we want it to be, but for the purposes of this demonstration and for the purposes of just building networks and getting started looking at gene expression data as networks, I think we'll do just fine w with that assumption. Uh, but keep in mind it can be changed and may be changed in the future. Okay, so um, we've gotten in our, uh, let's, take, let's take a look at that and see what that looks like. Okay, if we say we want to see all of the node attributes, now you will see it will show us for each time slot, okay, and I named them 0 through 5 because computer scientists usually start counting from 0. Sorry, it's just a bad habit. Um, but you see it has the expression data, okay, side by side with the what it calls the significance data okay so it'll say m value a value for time slot one m value a value for time slot two and so on and so forth um, and you can see that the expression data can be negative and so on and so forth so it, it basically that's just how it formats the data for its own purposes um, just wanted to point that out Okay, so the last step is we want to also associate our cluster data. So we'll say import node, this time node attributes, and we'll select clustered nodes.na and say open. And then when you close it, way at the end of the file, you will see that it now has added some cluster data. And as you click on different nodes, that cluster will change because we've mapped uh, each node to its appropriate cluster. Okay, so all of our data importing is basically done. All right, so far, so good. Now let's start thinking through some analysis. Okay, the first thing that we'll want to do is probably take a look at that hierarchical clustering question. Okay, and um, we've seen this menu before. Uh, we'll select Pearson just for consistency. And um, the easiest way to get a good reading out of this is to just select the EXP values from the gene expression data. Okay, we don't want our significance values, we just want the expression values, the EXP values. So select each one of those. And most everything else you can pretty much leave as is. Okay, so we've got those selected, that all looks good. Let's just go ahead and create our clusters. Okay, and then we can visualize those clusters. I'm gonna maximize this just so that we can uh, get a good sense of it. Um, one of the things that you'll see, and we've gotten some really nice um, laid out data here. We were talking earlier today about how um, the data set it could be naturally broken into two sort of different sets, okay? Ones that start activated and finish not activated, and ones that do the opposite, start out not activated but end up being activated. We can actually see that high-level structure here in this encoding. If you see, if we take it right here, if I highlight the right segment, if it lets me highlight the right segment here, just bear with me. There it is. Okay, notice um, everything in this cluster starts out blue, okay, or 
deactivated, I believe, and ends up in the yellow, activated. If we scroll up through this, it's very consistent all the way through. Okay, not perfect, but very consistent. And then once we get to that second cluster, right, the edge of the cluster that begins with the blue and ends with the yellow, you'll see that the other nodes in that cluster, in the, in the opposite cluster, do the exact opposite behavior. Okay, so if we scroll up here and we select, oh, there it is and we select this branch, okay, now everything in that branch does basically the opposite. It starts out activated and finishes deactivated. Um, this is pretty highly structured data, okay, so we've got two big clumps of data um, based on the behavior at each one of these timestamps, okay, that's very, very interesting. And uh, one of the things that we'll want to see is, can we replicate this structure, this sort of two giant node structure in our, um, in our networks when we create them? All right. So this is one thing that we were talking about as we started talking through this data. And we can actually see there's a pretty well demarcated line um, that separates the data that goes from activated to deactivated and then deactivated to activated over time. So we'll want to make sure, we'll want to see if we can actually bring that out in the clusters that we create. All right. And keep in mind, you can drill down into these hierarchical clusters as finely as you'd like. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of time to play around with all of these different features. Um, but for now, I think that's enough just to get us to the next step. Okay, so we can close this out. So all of those things are still available to us. We can create those clusters as needed and um, analyze them at will. But what we really wanted to do with the software and what we've been aiming toward is to actually create a network from this data. Turns out this is pretty straightforward if you have um, expression correlation. And that's a plugin that was produced to do precisely this. Okay. Um, if you have it in your plugins section, it'll be right under cluster, just a few under cluster. Uh, you're looking for plugins, expression correlation network, and be sure that you do not click construct correlation network. That will give you a network with the default settings, and it will create an absolutely giant structure that will be extremely difficult to um, work with. What I recommend instead is go to advanced options, go to the gene network preview histogram and it'll give you data that looks something like this okay and what it's doing is it's giving you a sense of how much how many interactions do we actually consider relevant okay the default is to cut off everything that's greater than 0. Point, negative 0. 0.95 and to cut off everything that's less than 0 0.95 on the high end. If we do it that way, it'll produce 553,000 interactions and change. In other words, our network will have 553,000 links. That's way too much. Okay, we don't want that. Moreover, I'm pretty sure, and you know, this is something that we can easily correct if this assumption isn't, isn't true, but I'm going to assume for the purposes of this exercise, that we don't need this low band, that anything that's down here we just want to throw away. All we care about are the positive relationships, right? The positive correlations between these genes. And again, it's easy enough to change if that's not true. So by simply unchecking that parameter, we can more or less cut those, the number of edges that we're going to get in, in half, a little bit less than half. But still, 300,000 and change is way too much for us to really analyze. So what we want to do is start to tune this so that we can get a number of interactions that we think we can really work with. Okay, so 9.6, let's try 9.7. Okay, it's getting down there. It's still not quite enough. 9.8. And all right, well, at least 80,000. That still sounds like kind of a lot. Let's take it to 99. And that should drop us down to 25,000 links or so. Uh, this should be something that should give us enough structure to be interesting, but not destroy our computer with lots of extra links. And again, we can always tune it 
and create a new network for a new purpose later. But for now, this is a pretty good starting point. So let's uncheck the low cutoff checkbox and let's set the high cutoff to 0.99. And that would get us about 25,000 interactions between all these nodes. So once you click OK, it's going to build the network for you. And you will see this sort of giant glob of, you know, links where if you start to back out of this, it'll just start to look like, you know, a lot of white dots on a basically giant blue field. Okay, so it won't really look very much. In other words, there's a whole lot of structure when you first do this, right? We have our links now, but big deal, it doesn't look like anything. So I would start by saying layout, site escape layouts, and give it a force directed layout that's unweighted. Okay, we, we can change this later, but this will get us to a nice starting point so that we can start to look at this data. And it might take a little time, you know, don't let that throw you, it's doing its thing. Okay, and what we see immediately, what comes out of the other end of this type of um, visualization is sort of what we were looking for, right? We've got these two large structures, and that's interesting, right? Because in networking, that doesn't always happen too often, where we get these sort of two giant components in a way. That's kind of interesting. Um, and what we might like to do is we might like to find out if these two components are um, representative of the clusters that we expect. So for example, um, you know, if this is the cluster that represented sort of the earlier time segments, would we see clusters one through four or one through five? And if these represent later time segments, would we see sort of five through nine or six through nine, right? That might be an interesting thing to, to ask. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that at any time you want, okay, if you want to look at a group of nodes and the data associated with them, you can just highlight them all, okay? It'll automatically sort of highlight it and sort of everything will be selected. And all of those nodes will be collected for you in the data panel at the bottom. Okay, so now every single one of those nodes is available for you. If we wanted to, we could just breeze through the cluster data associated with all of those nodes. Oh, and by the way, if we don't want to see all of this um, data, if we want to actually select which attributes we want to see, because right now, maybe our expression data is just kind of getting in our way, we can just unselect all of these right? and make it a little easier for us to read, because we'd probably like to see which genes are associated with which clusters, okay? and, and we can do that. It's, it's really easy. You can select that. Um, as we scroll through this data, you're going to see lots of one through fives. Um, every once in a while, we'll see some fives, but very few um, six through nines. That was pretty much what we were discussing when we started looking at this data. Okay, so th this is not something that I knew before I started playing around with this, but it turns out that the structure that we expected. Um, really does conform, and I have not seen a single 8 or 9 in this data. Okay, now obviously there might be 1 or 2, but um, so far, you know, this looks like a pretty meaningful cluster if we look at some of the other clusters that we've been applying to the wild type data. All right, so at this point what we, we may say is, you know what, this segment of the network is so important to me that I want to save this as a sub-network. Okay, very easy to do. Just go right above the image. There's a little, um, I don't know, a little image of a graph. And it'll let you, let me highlight that again, create a new network from selected nodes with all the edges. You just click that button, and you notice it will take all of the nodes that you've had selected, create a new network that you can work with independently. Okay, now you can lay this out. Like So if I wanted to just lay this out by itself, Right, I could do that, and it'll won't affect anything in the other network. So, you know, and you see, I mean, it's more or less the same structure, but it changed a few things and maybe made a few things easier to see. So, it, as you're going through your analysis, if you if you get a certain cluster of nodes, and you're like, wow, that's just so interesting. I, I can't let that go. Just highlight it and click this button, and you'll get a new network. Um, so, if we want to try this again we could do the same thing with this network, right? So let's select everybody, okay? 
And notice, I mean, just from a brief perusal, the first couple nodes that are selected all represent things sort of five and up, right? So we've got, you know, I see lots of sixes, nines, eights, okay? So um, our informal hypothesis uh, looks to be more or less correct that these things are forming giant clusters based on um, clusters one through five or six through nine. So uh, that's something that we'll want to think about. And again, if I want to, you know, wow, that's just too neat. I can't let that go. I can always just extract that into its own network and treat that by itself. Okay, so there are a few things that are really easy to do and Cytoscape is designed to make that that easy. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about a few other things. Let's go back to our original network. Um, one of the things that we'll certainly want to do is spend some time doing community detection. Okay, some time finding communities of genes or clusters of genes inside of these clusters that have the kind of information that we really care about. Okay, if we want to do that, um, the easiest way to do it is to go to plugins. I like mCode. There are many, many other types of uh, software or types of plugins that will do this for you. I like mCode because I think it's really cool and easy to use. So if you say start mCode, uh, just we're going to run this against the whole network. You can tune things like network scoring and cluster finding. I, I find that its defaults are pretty much fine. Um, so for now, we're just going to use defaults, and if we feel that we want to tune these things, we can later. Click Analyze, and what mCode will do for us, it'll basically search through all of the uh, network structure that we have and pull out things that have you know very, very tight coupling, right? It's things that are really, really tightly coupled. And the rank number one is a really good example. Okay, by the way, it produces lots of results for us. Okay, so this produced 156 different clusters um, with lots of different shapes and sizes, ranging from ones that, you know, include as many as 87 nodes to ones that include, you know, just four or five. Right? So if we decide that, you know, well, I really want to look at this data, right, this is the cluster that I want to see, you can always select that cluster and notice that cluster now will be represented both visually inside the cluster that it's in, right? And the data for all of the nodes will be down in the data panel. Okay, so this is a great way to filter, right? Like I have the structure that M code created, right? I just have to click on it. It'll be automatically highlighted in the overall structure and I'll be able to look at the individual data points at the gene level. Okay, so one of the great things, one of the things that, that networks make really easy are trying to connect the parts to the whole. And this tool is really, really great at letting you do that. I can find a cluster in a large bed of data, see where it's situated in that data so I know how it's related to the whole. And at the same time, I can go all the way down to the gene level and see what's in there. Okay, and one of the things that you'll see, I mean, there are 69 nodes in this cluster. Take a look at how many fours you're seeing. I'm scrolling now. I have not seen anything other than a four here. So this may be a structure that is really interesting. I'm, offhand, I don't recall what cluster four it, it does or is supposed to do, but there is clearly some network structure here related to cluster four, okay? And we could, you know, go through this a whole set of times, okay? So uh, these are the nodes related to rank two and rank three, and it will always keep us up to date with what's happening inside these clusters, okay? And I think if we scroll down a little further, okay, now we see that there's one on this side. Okay, notice if we look at the data, again, we've got lots of eights, sevens, Right, lots of data items related to that that are what we've come to expect from these two giant components, okay, that they are divided based on these clusters. Okay, and if we scroll down, right, we'll see all different kinds of other structures here that will be interesting. And I'm gonna pick one just to show you a couple other things that you can do with it. Uh, let's find an interesting one here. Uh, where are you? Well, this one's good enough. 
Okay, let's just say for whatever reason we find this structure to be really compelling. Okay, it looks like this is a cluster of, uh, of ones here. Uh, all of the same rules apply. If I want to create a completely separate node of just this cluster, okay, just these nine nodes, I can hit the same button and there we go. We get a very, very nice compact view of just that just that structure, okay? And we can, you know, uh, visualize it the way we want to, and we can, you know, deal with it as a separate network, okay? Notice it created our separate network for us. So M code preserves a lot of the other features that we've been using all along, okay? So you can have multiple networks open and be analyzing multiple networks at the same time. Okay, so M code is a really great tool for being able to um, find intermediate structures, okay? Not necessarily macro structures, not necessarily network motifs, but if you want to find intermediate structures um, that might represent clusters of genes that function together to get some job done, M code is one uh, very handy way to get that done, okay? A couple of other things that might be useful um, as you're performing analysis. Um, sometimes what happens is you don't necessarily want to, we've been spending a lot of time sort of extracting subnets and things like that, and of course that's useful. But if we go back to the first um, sort of, let's go back to the biggest one, right? If we go back to one of the really large clusters, um, we may find after looking at this, this isn't particularly interesting to us, but we don't really want to remove it either, and we, we want to sort of find some way to collapse all of these nodes into one node. If we wanted to do that, okay, that's where the meta node plugin comes in. Okay, we can go to plugins, go to meta node, and what we're going to say is we want to create a meta node. Right? And I might call this M code, you know, rank two. Right, give it a clever name like that. Say okay. And what this will do, and actually rather quickly, um, all of the individual nodes will now disappear, okay? They've basically been collapsed into one meta node. And if I want to recover that meta node, I can basically come here and say, expand the meta node, I can add nodes to it, I can treat it just like anything else, I can expand all of them, okay? Um, so it's a nice way if you just want to start to um, basically simplify part of the structure without removing it from its overall context, okay? In other words, reduce part of a network, right? or summarize it in some way. MetaNode will let you do that, and it'll work with any selection of nodes. So if I wanted to say, just to make a really drastic example, if I wanted to say, sort of select this entire part of the network, okay, and say, I just don't want to pay attention to that right now, we can take it and use it as create a, a new meta node for it. Okay, and I'll just call it giant cluster two. Um, now there's a lot of nodes here, so this might actually take a little while, but in theory, once this is done, that whole component should be replaced with one and only one node if my computer does not blow up. Okay, so, um, we're gonna let that work for a little bit. Okay, and oh, did it work? Ah, and there we go. Um, it's already gone, and if I click on this, I have to, might have to zoom in a little bit so I can see it. Okay, if I click on this, that entire network has been replaced with one meta node called Giant Cluster. And if I wanted to, I could just say, ch -ch -ch, you know, expand meta node Giant Cluster 2, and there we go, it's back. So um, if you're looking for ways to reduce part of the network to actually help you structure it or do some analysis or you don't just want to pull the whole thing out, MetaNode is a way for you to reduce the network. Okay, so that's another technique that's really, really um, popular and uh, for, for very good reason. Uh, let's jump back to this node here, this um, little structure here. Let's say that for whatever reason, we think that this is just so cool 
that I want to take a picture of it. Like I, I just can't let this go, right? I want to make sure that somebody sees these configuration of nodes or I think I've discovered something important and I just can't let it go. If we want to quickly take a picture of it, right? Really simple, just click on the uh, graphics, right? The little camera there. Select the format that you want. I like JPEG, but you can choose whatever you like. I almost always give it a name. Um, so, you know, just call it sort of small cluster example, right? Otherwise, the default, it'll give you that really long sort of automatic name based on the network. And then when you say, okay, it'll give you a sort of set of options for exporting JPEGs. You can pretty much pick, the, the defaults are fine. You say, okay, and then if you go back to your your data, you'll see that my JPEG file, if everything went well, small cluster example, should be there. Okay, and notice if you had a particular node highlighted, you would see it here. All of the labels are as is, and you know you can basically talk about the structure or send this picture to somebody who doesn't have the software, and they can start to participate in the discussion. Okay. So at this point, right, we've seen that we can sort of take some pictures, we can do lots of different things. Um, let's go back to the original structure. And um, I just wanna show a few things about visualization and filtering uh, that might actually be helpful. Um, one of the things that we'll want to start to do is to um, assign nodes different color properties and things like this, which can really aid in analysis. And in particular, in this case, one of the things that we might want to see is, you know, we've been assuming that clusters one through five are here and clusters six through nine are here. Uh, as it turns out, we can actually get a little better view on that if we adjust node color based on, if we adjust node color based on cluster. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll, so you go to the Viz Mapper, okay, you select node color, and in this case we're going to pick a discrete mapper, all right, and what the discrete mapper does is for each value that we have, we can assign a particular color to it. So for cluster one, I want cluster one to appear white, and notice all of the nodes associated with cluster one are now white. Let's say I want cluster two to be gray. I can make that gray. Now we have gray. I can do the same thing with cluster three. Let's make that black. Okay, a whole lot of black shows up. And similarly with four, I mean, I'll make four some sort of cyan color. Cluster five, I'll make blue. And slowly but surely, we can start to basically assign all the colors to different clusters that we have. Um, one of the nice things about the software is that it lets you pair analytical ability with uh, visual observation. So this is a really easy way to prove to ourselves that what we've been sort of suspecting all along is more or less true. That for the most part, clusters one through five are in this giant component, although we do see one red exception right there. Um, and for, with respect to the other giant component, for the most part, what we see is six clusters six through nine are in this one. And we can see that visually just by the colors that we have. And again, if we think that this is a compelling image, we can export this. I don't want it to be PNG, I want it to be JPEG. Right. And I would say something like clusters by color. Say okay. Can select the defaults. Then if we go back to our There we go, we've exported it. Um, so basically the tool gives you lots of ways to analyze and visualize the data. 
And at this point, it probably makes uh, more sense for you to play around with it than for me to keep talking. So uh, in summary, what we've done today is basically um, talked about how we can take the gene expression data and reformat it with Java so that Cytoscape can read it. Okay, We learned about the SIF file format, the uh, node attribute NA file format, and the uh, PVALS format for uh, expression data. We learned how to import those. We learned how to do some hierarchical clustering with that data, how to create some networks, and how to do some basic analysis with uh, those networks with some of the tools that we see here. So have fun. <laughs>